Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for participating in today's Youth in Custody Practice Model Informational Call for our Cohort 3 application process. I'm going to quickly turn it over to Jonah, who's going to cover some quick housekeeping information, and then we'll come back and do some additional uh, welcome and introductions. Thank you, Mike. Uh, before we be begin, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Uh, if you're calling in through the phone, use your PIN number. All attendees will be muted for the duration of this webinar. However, you can type questions at any time in the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll try to answer all questions uh, during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Also, a summary of the questions asked and answered on the webinar will be posted on the CJCA and CJJR websites. All webinar attendees uh, can also download a copy of the Youth in Custody Practice Model Abbreviated Guide, which is added as a handout and you should see that in your GoToWebinar control panel as well. And now I'll pass it over to Shea Bilchik, Director for the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform. Thank you, and welcome everybody. Uh, we're delighted to host this informational webinar, uh, thrilled with the response. Uh, Mike Dempsey will talk a little bit more about the response that we received and who's on the call, but I just wanna first welcome you uh, to the conversation and thank you for your interest in the practice model. Um, a little bit of history, a little bit. we had uh, had conversations with CJCA several years ago about some of the trends that we had seen in the juvenile justice field. And I think these are trends that are well known to you as well. We saw a tremendous decrease in the number of young people who were being committed into residential placement, whether it be a correctional facility or a residential treatment center. We've seen a lot of celebration in the country about that trend line, uh, which we supported, because we knew that a lot of the kids who were going into institutional settings could be served just as well <clears throat> in the community, uh, in less structured programming, and perhaps just with community supervision. The part of the conversation we had not been hearing, though, was what did this mean for correctional practitioners who were still serving young people in those facilities, except a different profile of young people? And by that I mean, by that uh, I mean generally as a cohort, a different uh, cohort of, of risk level and of level of need. And we felt that not enough attention had been put on what does the staff need now to succeed with those young people uh, that present additional challenges. And, and quite candidly, as we would talk to correctional professionals, they would tell us that when we had more of a mixed population, some of the lower risk or moderate risk kids almost provided respite for us uh, as we handled the, the tougher kids. And now those kids are gone. And now those kids. So we sat down as two organizations, uh, came up with an idea to develop a compendium, or in this instance, a practice model, that would lay out all the research and knowledge that had been gathered uh, that would make the most effective correctional uh, practice model possible. And that's what we've done here with the youth and custody practice model. It took us a couple of years to build it. Uh, we've now introduced it, as you'll hear, in a couple of cohorts, and we'll talk more about that. And you'll to hear from a couple of representatives from those cohorts, and we've been thrilled with the response. Um, because it really focuses on a dimension of the juvenile justice trends that we didn't see getting the attention it needed, which was the correctional staff and correctional agencies and how to be most successful in working with the population of youth we simply did not want to give up on. So I, I thank you again. I'm going to turn it over to Mike to make some introductory comments as well, and then I'll be back with you to talk about the consulting team. Thank you, Jake. Um, good afternoon, and welcome again, everyone, and thank you for participating in uh, today's informational webinar. My name is Mike Dempsey, and I'm the Executive Director for the Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators, which is also known as CJCA. As you may know, CJCA is a national nonprofit organization which was formed in 1994 to improve juvenile justice systems correctional services, programs, and practices for youth entrusted to the care of juvenile justice systems. CJCA fulfills its mission through education, national conferences, best practice resources, and technical assistance programs, such as the Youth Custody Practice Model. The Youth and Custody Practice Model is offered to juvenile justice organizations through our partnership with the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform at Georgetown University, along with our tremendous consulting team which she will introduce shortly. I want to quickly cover um, our goals for today's webinar. We will be, which will be provide you all with an overview of the Youth in Custody Initiative, 
So here's some observations from prior youth and custody practice model site participants. And finally, to thoroughly describe the application process and to answer any pending questions you may have. So thank you again for participating in today's webinar, and I'll turn it over to Shay to begin introducing our consulting team. Great. Thanks, thanks Mike. Um, so in putting the practice model together, we realized that simply building a document, even if it would be the most comprehensive document possible from the point in time that a child was committed into placement to the point in time they were released from their aftercare or parole, that we needed to complement that with a strong training and consultation element to how it would be introduced and how it would be adopted. So outside of the, the core group of folks that are um, uh, the, part of the authoring team, and you'll, you'll hear more about them, we identified a specific consulting team. There's some crossover in that. And they consist of Michael Lampierre, Kelly Dadel, Stephanie Vetter, and Jen Willard. And I'm gonna turn it over to them to introduce themselves so you get a sense of who we've brought on board that will be working with the site selected in implementing the model. Great, thank you, Shay, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Lampierre, and I'm the Deputy Director for Juvenile Justice System Improvement and Communications at the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform at Georgetown University. And I am uh, the lead editor and one of the co-authors of the Youth and Custody Practice Model. You'll be hearing from me quite a bit. Um, so for now, I'll just share a little bit about my background, uh, which uh, includes a focus on juvenile justice throughout the entirety of my career through a variety of perspectives. Uh, prior to coming to Georgetown, I served as the program coordinator of the National Center for Youth in Custody, which was a, an OJJDP-sponsored national training and technical assistance center focused on enhancing practices for young people um, in facilities and upon uh, reentry. And it was through that experience that I was able to get all around the country um, learning about uh, strategies uh, to uh, maximize our chances of improving outcomes for young people, for staff, for families and for communities. Um, I uh, worked in the District of Columbia with the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, the cabinet level juvenile justice agency in the district where I served as uh, a chief of staff of the agency and um, was responsible for overseeing um, uh, both a detention center uh, as well as a long-term um, residential facility in the New Beginnings Youth Development Center. It's uh, that experience, along with my work at the National Center for Youth in Custody, as well as my time uh, as a public defender um, in the public defender service of the District of Columbia, as well as um, working for a number of legal organizations um, that has informed the development of the practice model and the ongoing uh, consultation uh, for it. So again, you'll hear my voice quite a bit throughout the webinar. I wanna thank everybody for joining us today and um, for your interest in, in the model. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Dadel, um, who is also one of the co-authors uh, of the practice model and lead consultants on this project. Dr. Dadel. Thanks, Michael. Good afternoon, everyone. Like Michael said, I was one of the co-authors of the Youth and Custody Practice Model and uh, worked with several of our sites in both cohorts one and two. Um, I. It, I have kind of a mishmash of projects that I work on. I do a lot of research on risk assessment validation. Um, I've worked as a coach for the performance-based standards project. I've provided technical assistance to the juvenile detention alternatives initiative sites. But most of my time is spent as a court monitor and subject matter expert in lawsuits that involve the conditions of confinement in secure juvenile justice facilities. Um, that takes me to many facilities around the country, uh, most of whom are struggling with the same things around staff and youth safety, producing better outcomes for kids, trying to find engaging programming. And so there's kind of a natural link with the youth and custody practice model in that work. What's really exciting to me is having the opportunity to work with sites who rather than being compelled by the Justice Department to improve the conditions in their facilities, they come with their own commitment to improve the state of their facilities to improve safety for youth and staff and improve outcomes for kids. 
So the youth in custody practice model is just real near and dear to my heart because it found so much inspiration and commitment among the folks who have joined us in the previous two cohorts. With that, I'll turn it over to Stephanie Vetter. Thank you, Dr. Dadel. This is Stephanie Vetter. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a national consultant and trainer, um, largely to uh, the network of national JDAI sites, the Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative sites. And for the last 15 years or so, have engaged with multiple county and state level strategic planning groups to um, identify through data analysis and um, other survey results, those types of practice improvements that would literally um, be related to improving outcomes for kids. So there's process improvements and there's outcome improvements and sort of helping stakeholders think through those strategically um, is one area that I've been working with um, nine states right now. Um, and then as a consultant with Georgetown University in the youth in custody practice model, I've had the pleasure of working with um, the team in Connecticut, um, the court support services division of the Connecticut judicial branch and implementing the best practices that the youth in custody practice model offers as well as in LA County. Um, so my experience also includes direct service work. I started out in um, group homes as a direct staff uh, provider and um, worked in Portland, Oregon for many years as a juvenile probation officer. Basically spent a good chunk of my uh, career with, um, with working with youth and on behalf of improving youth outcomes. So I'm really happy to be part of this team and I'm excited that you are all uh, learning more about this practice model. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Willard. Jen, are you there? Jen, are you there? I'm, I'm gonna channel Dr. Willard, Stephanie. She was unable to make the call today. So um, this again is Shay Bilchik talking. I'm a professor at Georgetown University and, and Jen is also a professor here. Dr. Willard has been with the university for probably over 10 to 15 years. Um, she's an associate professor in the School of Psychology uh, her main areas of research are youth development, juvenile justice related issues, uh, criminal justice related issues, and a lot of work around uh, the issues of youth and the way they experience the system as well as working with families. So what we've done is through CJCA uh, agreed that Dr. Willer would be our independent evaluator. So she is going to be under contract to work on an evaluation template that we will work with the selected sites in adopting. And we will um, make sure that, if, at a minimum, the elements that we're talking about that need to be tracked with the model are in place, but it does not prevent you from working with Dr. Willard to go beyond that. Uh, while Dr. Willard will engage with you up to two years longer than we will in the actual implementation process, um, again, there's nothing that keeps you from working with her longer than that if you so, cho so choose. Um, she's been a delight to work with she's the site. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy, if you're one of the selected sites, being able to engage in, with data the way uh, Dr. Willard brings it to life. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Mike so we can talk some more about the goals of the webinar and who's with us on the phone today. All right. Thank you, Shay. So as you all can hear, um, we have very knowledgeable and experienced consultation team that will be working directly with each of the sites that are selected to participate in Cohort 3. I want to quickly thank all of our partner organizations who assisted us in getting the word out for our cohort application process, which included the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, the American Correctional Association, the American Probation and Parole Association, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, the Association of State Correctional Administrators, the Council of State Governments, the National Association of Counties, and the National Partnership for Juvenile Services, to name a few. We have 37 states and about 20 local county systems, as well as one jurisdiction from New Brunswick, Canada, registered for today's call. We also have several private providers who are registered and participating in the call today. 
this represents a tremendous response. So again, I thank you all for your interest and I thank all of our partner organizations for helping us get the word out. So Michael, I believe uh, we'll turn it over to you at this point and we'll begin with the rest of the presentation. Great, thank you, Mike. And um, what we'd like to do for this portion of the webinar is just to cover um, in a little bit more detail what the Youth in Custody Practice Model Initiative is all about, um, how it was developed, and the process that we use to deliver the training and technical assistance. As uh, Shay and Mike have indicated, um, this initiative is really designed to assist juvenile justice agencies and facilities to align uh, their current policies and practices with what the research shows is effective at uh, achieving the outcomes that we care about with respect to young people, to their families, to staff, and to communities. And so the initiative is um, an 18-month initiative where we partner with participating sites to explore best practices in serving youth in custody from the point of facility admission all the way to community reentry, and to uh, fashion strategies and working together to enhance the way that business is conducted in the jurisdiction. So it is a tremendous opportunity to take a step back um, from the day-to-day -day responsibilities that uh, system and facility staff um, have and to look at the bigger picture of how all of the policies and practices and approaches relate to uh, those guiding principles and to those uh, best practices that we know are designed to achieve those outcomes. I can tell you that as a former juvenile justice administrator myself, having the opportunity to take that step back and to reflect upon um, best practice is one um, that is unique. Uh, we understand the day-to-day the -day, uh, duties and responsibilities that um, facility staff and agency staff have. And this initiative really is a partnership. It's a collaboration that's designed um, to allow that space to have the conversations about what uh, is going well in the jurisdiction and celebrating those strengths, while at the same time having a conversation of ways um, that we might be able to do our work uh, better. So as Shay mentioned, um, you know, the reasons that we developed it uh, was that we were seeing this, this trend, this phenomenon nationally, that as systems got smarter and better around um, identifying which young people um, should be placed in facilities based on risk, what was left was a higher concentration of young people with um, both high risk and with significant needs. And um, we haven't seen, from a data perspective, um, an analysis of this nationally. This is primarily what we've heard anecdotally, but consistently from coast to coast and from every part of the country, we hear this. We hear this in the detention facilities and we hear it in the post-disposition um, residential facilities that um, just the, the population of young people that we're serving, um, by and large, is a higher concentration of this high risk, high needs. And so we wanted to develop a guide, a roadmap to allow um, system staff um, a way to analyze their current practices in serving this population and to provide um, a road forward for enhancing practice. Um, we also um, understand uh, when it comes to juvenile justice practice that um, for many systems and many agencies, um, unfortunately we're drawn to the um, latest, greatest uh, program or um, what many refer to as the flavor of the month type approach. And really what this practice model is designed to do is to think about the big picture and how everything that we do in serving youth in custody is related um, to those core research-based principles that we know are so important. So this is really um, a, an impetus for the development of the, of the model itself and the initiative um, was this need to take a look at what we're doing in a comprehensive way, stemming from what the research tells us um, we should be focused on. And that really is the opportunity that is offered here. The practice model itself is, uh, as I mentioned, a research-based guide um, to serving uh, youth in custody. 
I will say that um, when we wrote it, um, we had the post-dispositional facilities in mind. But as um, you'll hear about, as we've talked about um, this work and as we've conducted the initiative, we had great interest in expanding this approach also to detention facilities. And you'll hear in, in just a few minutes uh, from uh, Charles Bowright from the San Diego team, he'll talk a little bit about how they've applied the practice model to the detention facilities that they operate as well. So that has been an, um, an important development of this model and something that you all should know as prospective applicants, that this is something that can be implemented both in your post-dispositional post facilities, but also in your detention facilities. It can be implemented whether those facilities are operated um, by the state or county uh, run agencies or whether it's operated by uh, private providers. Um, you'll also hear from the Florida team, uh, Laura Moneyham and Garrett Laura Tucker, who'll talk a little bit about how this practice model has been uh, applied to the private providers that Florida DJJ works with as well. Um, so keep that in mind as, you, as we think about this. But the practice model guide sets forth over 70 policy and practice elements over the course of four discrete practice areas that I'll cover in just a minute. Um, we spent uh, a, a well over a year developing uh, the publication. Um, and here you see reflected on the screen uh, the authoring team, which included myself and Dr. Dadel, who you just heard from, as well as Dr. Uh, Monique Mero, who many of you on the line may be familiar with. She's one of the most uh, foremost um, experts and uh, widely considered um, one of the, the most important voices when it comes to trauma responsive care in juvenile justice. Uh, Dr. Mero was part of our, our team, as well as Farah Boris Paxarush, who at the time was the director of the Oregon Youth Authority um, and also an important uh, voice in juvenile justice. Um, Shay uh, Bilchek, the director of my organization, as well as Ned Logren, who was the uh, former executive director of CJCA, also played an important role in guiding the development of the, the guide. And also as part of uh, this process, we reached out to a series of experts in the field to um, review the document when it was in draft form, to, to get their feedback and their insight. Our goal was to create a guide that was practical and that could really guide um, the delivery of um, training and technical assistance. And so we wanted folks in the field who understood uh, this work to provide a feedback as to whether we are on the right track. And we, we received wonderful um, insight from that group and we incorporated that into the final uh, product. Um, the goals of the practice model you see reflected here. Um, and that includes promoting safe, fair, and healthy environments for young people, staff, and families, preparing, equipping, and empowering, and supporting staff to provide effective services, increasing positive youth and family experiences and outcomes, and enhancing community safety. Now, I will say this, the practice model is based from the research and based from best practice. And um, we will talk in just a minute the, about the data and evaluation component of this initiative, which is critically important. But in many ways, um, the, the jurisdictions that have participated in the first two cohorts are um, in essentially piloting uh, this practice model. We have a hypothesis that because the practices that are featured in the practice model do stem from the research, that um, if implemented with fidelity, we will achieve these goals in the jurisdictions that participate. Um, but this is, this is the heart of what we're trying to achieve in working with facilities. I want to bring up and lift up for you all number two on this slide, because one of the, the key elements of this practice model is something that we hold dear to our hearts, which is that oftentimes what we see when it comes to juvenile justice reform initiatives is that the focus primarily is on um, the youth that we serve. And rightly so. It's critically important that we think about how young people experience our facilities, experience our programs, all the way through community reentry. But in our view, um, many uh, initiatives do not equally focus on the staff. And we know that at the end of the day, these goals, in order to achieve them, that it depends on a strong workforce 
that is trained, that is supported to do their work, that is equipped to do their work, and that is recognized for the good work that we do. This is incredibly challenging uh, work for the staff who operate these facilities and who continue the work um, in the communities. And so we really hold um, uh, as, a, as a principle here um, the notion of staff support being as, as, as important as anything else that we can talk about in moving this, this work forward. Um, and you'll see that reflected uh, in um, the, the presentation today as well as the, the work that the sites who have worked with us on have taken this on uh, recognizing the importance of the staff piece. Here you see the four uh, practice areas that um, we explore um, in working with the participating sites. These are reflected in the abbreviated guide that all of you have the ability to download um, on, your, on your screens now, as was, as was um, shared earlier. I will say is if you have any issues uh, downloading uh, that uh, guide, please reach out to us and we'll be happy to email it to you. We also have them posted on the CJJR and CJCA uh, websites um, for download as well. But these are the four areas that we explore and in the interest of time. I won't go into them in great depth, but we start with a discussion around case planning, um, understanding that um, using uh, key assessment information to drive our case plans that can really serve as the spine of service delivery moving forward is critically important. Um, we then have uh, a focus on what happens within the walls of the facility, and we explore 10 different domains within um, the facility-based services and supports practice area. And again, those are featured in the abbreviated guide. You'll see that we talk about education and programming and uh, medical and uh, mental health and behavioral health services. We talk about staff support and empowering the youth voice. We, we look at um, the uh, environment within the facility. We uh, talk about uh, ways to support and motiva uh, motivate positive behavior. We talk about crisis management. We talk about um, ways to manage the influence of gangs within the facility. So um, it really leads to a rich discussion about best practices in those areas, um, what's going well and what can be improved. And then the final two uh, practice areas focus on how do we go about transition and reentry planning and implementation, and then what happens when the young person is back in the community, what are best practices when it comes to that, um, what many refer to as aftercare or parole piece, after the young people leave the facility and they're in the community, how do we structure our services, our supervision, our approaches in a way that the research tells us will lead to um, the best outcomes. We also have um, themes and considerations that permeate everything that we do in this work. And here you see them uh, reflected on the screen. Um, we have a strong component that, that focuses on the importance of family engagement. We know that outcomes are improved if families are valued and meaningfully involved um, in the process. And so family engagement and empowerment and partnership um, is something that we explore as part of the model. We also are um, very uh, uh, concerned with ensuring fairness and equity in everything that we do in juvenile justice based on what the research tells us is critically important. And so we have a component that explores um, racial and ethnic disparities in particular at the facility level, which nationally we know there's been a lot of work around disparities on the front end. Um, and at various stages in the process, um, but perhaps less focus on what happens when the young person is actually within the facility. What can we do to stem further system penetration um, and to address some of those disparities that we see? And then, of course, making sure that on a parallel track, while we work on best practice within the facility, that the systems are focused on what we can be doing to promote those community based interventions and efforts. As I mentioned, this is an 18-month uh, initiative um, for the next cohort of sites. What we're looking at is a timeline of um, April 2019 going all the way to October 2020. Um, this is supported by a team of uh, lead consultants. Um, we are accepting up to four jurisdictions um, to participate in cohort three. And, each, and uh, each, each participating site will have at least two designated lead consultants 
who will be um, with uh, the team throughout the entire process, as I'll, as I'll share in just a minute. We have a combination of site visits and phone calls um, that guides the process. And those two lead consultants will be there for every one of those um, instances. We also have, as part of this um, training and TA package, um, it's a really a wonderful feature. I think the sites that have participated with us um, so far have enjoyed this feature of the, the model, which is we built in 15 uh, days of consultation from specialized subject matter experts. So to the extent that um, sites go down uh, the list of areas that we cover over the course of the 18 months and um, decide that they want to take a deeper dive in a particular area, say it's family engagement or say it's, it's um, re addressing racial and ethnic disparities or um, you know, expanding their behavior motivation systems within their facilities, we have access to the combination of CJJR and CJCA we have access to experts all around the country to bring in for that purpose. And we build in, as part of the package, 15 days to explore that. Um, so there's some flexibility there. We really uh, work with the sites to identify what are the areas that they'd like to bring in these additional consultants to, um, to assist. The practice model um, is to be piloted in up to three uh, demonstration facilities in your jurisdiction. So participating sites, um, have the flexibility to decide which facilities they'd like to um, focus on as part of this. Um, and as I mentioned, this can be detention, it can be post-dispositional facilities, and uh, it can be operated uh, by uh, government agencies, it can be operated privately. Um, we, there's some flexibility built in there. Um, but the idea is that uh, we'd like to uh, pilot the practice model in those three sites. The consultants have an opportunity to visit and tour um, each of those programs as part of it and to offer feedback uh, and observations uh, as and to um, practice in those in those programs. And um, then as part of the process, we also work with jurisdictions to talk about how can you take uh, the process that's uh, used process. in piloting in those three facilities and expand it to the other facilities that the agency or organization is responsible for operating. So you'll hear in a few minutes from the Florida team who will talk about the process that they used in piloting the practice model in three of their facilities, but then went on to expand the approach to every uh, provider in the state that, um, that the agency contracts with. And so the expansion uh, element is important uh, here. We, we want the uh, learning and the process that takes place to, to um, permeate all throughout the, uh, the agency or the jurisdiction that we work with. And then finally, um, a key element of this work, as Shay uh, discussed, is the data and evaluation component. And um, Dr. Jen Willard and her team leads this effort for us. Ultimately, we are very invested in knowing that the strategies that are developed as part of this process are ones that actually have an impact on the outcomes that you all care about. So as part of the training and TA package, Dr. Willard conducts an evaluation of the strategies that are implemented as part of this process to assess whether um, the outcomes are improved, whether it be youth and staff safety, whether it be um, recidivism, whether it be some of those positive uh, outcomes that we care about, advancements in education, employment, and what have you. Um, Dr. Willard uh, conducts a pre and post evaluation where she looks at a cohort of young people who have gone through the programs before the introduction of the practice model strategies and then compares the outcomes from that cohort to a cohort of young people who have gone through the programs after the strategies have been implemented ultimately to assess the impact of the work. And so that's a very important piece and particularly important when it comes to the stakeholder engagement. We know that many of you work with partners and stakeholders who are very focused on the outcomes that you're achieving with the young people that you serve. So being able to demonstrate the uh, impact of these efforts becomes vitally important from a sustainability perspective. Um, as I mentioned, um, participating sites, uh, what, basically what we do is over the course of 18 months, we have six site visits um, where we conduct um, their, their day and a half trainings um, where we gradually go through in a very systematic way 
um, the content of the practice model. We have a discussion about where practice and policy currently is within the facilities and within the agencies um, as a way to compare existing practice to what the practices are set forth in the practice model. And then to the extent that there are any gaps between what you're currently doing and what best practice tells us we should be doing, we then work with you all to develop and implement plans to address those gaps. And that really is the, the heart of what we do is focusing on those practice enhancement plans, identifying ways to um, enhance what we do. And then finally, as I mentioned, um, the TA package also includes this focus on data collection and evaluation. On this slide, you see um, the sites that we have worked with to date in the first two cohorts of this initiative. Um, we started off working with uh, Florida DJJ, Massachusetts DYS, Texas JJD, and Star Vista Incorporated, which is one of the five care management organizations responsible for the delivery of juvenile justice services in Wayne County, Michigan, which is the Detroit area. Most recently, we have been working with a second cohort of sites, including the Connecticut Judicial Branch, CSSD, Los Angeles County Probation, and San Diego County Probation. And again, I want to use this opportunity to say the structure of um, these agencies really varies uh, across the board. So we've got state-run agencies, we've got county-run agencies, we've got facilities that are operated by um, you know, government agencies, we've got facilities that have been operated by private uh, providers as well. Um, so it really runs uh, the gamut um, here. I will say, um, and as I move to introducing our uh, colleagues from Florida to talk a little bit about their experience in engaging with us on the practice model, I will say that it has been, from our perspective, an absolute privilege and an honor to work with individuals who are so committed um, to improving outcomes for young people, for their families, for staff, and for communities. And on this webinar, um, we're privileged to have representatives from Florida and San Diego County who have taken on this work with nothing but a commitment to the young people that is served. And it really, from our perspective, being able to work with, um, you know, dynamic leaders such as Laura and Garrett and Charles has been uh, tremendous. And I know that the work continues and um, we look forward to that, but um, it has been uh, wonderful and we look forward to engaging with another four sites um, in cohort number three. So with that, um, I will remind everybody that we do have an opportunity for questions and answers. If anything, if you have any questions so far for anything that I said, please use the chat box on your screen to um, write them in and we'll make sure to address them towards the end of the webinar. But for now, um, I'd like to introduce Laura Moneyham and Garrett Tucker from the Florida Department of Juvenile Justice. Laura Moneyham is the Assistant Secretary of Residential Services for the department and Garrett Tucker is uh, a Program and Policy Coordinator um, for DJJ. Both Laura and Garrett um, have been the key individuals in Florida in guiding uh, the practice model uh, the initiative, practice model initiative and um, the you know the work that has has occurred in Florida has been tremendous and it's a testament to the leadership of Laura and Garrett moving this forward. So with that, I'd like to turn it now over to Laura and Garrett to share a little bit about their experiences in working uh, with us on the youth in custody practice model. Okay, thank you, Michael, um, and good afternoon, everybody, and Garrett is right here with me. Um, just as um, Shay was talking about earlier, um, about the, the changes nationally that folks have seen, um, in Florida, we saw some really drastic changes in our residential population. It was really a, con a condensation um, effect, because we went from from 2011, um, from 3,600 beds down to, um, we're at approximately 2,200 beds now. And even before that, we were at um, 7,000 beds at one point. And so the, we were getting kids that could easily have been served and should have been served in the community. So when we, when we condensed that population, we saw a, a real increase um, from 74% up to 88% 
of our moderate, high, and high risk to reoffend kids in our programs, and our low risk kids drop from around 12% to 5%. So what Shay had talked about earlier that you get kind of a respite, a little bit of a break when you've got the the kids in that um, are are not really super challenging. So when when we we saw that and what we saw was a kind of a global reaction across all of our providers um, that it was kind of an instinctual hardening in the program culture. And it, it was becoming in response, the staff's response, the um, clinician's response to these harder to deal with, harder to work with kids, more challenged kids, kids from a, a, a much more, um, more likely to have come from a traumatized background. So they come in with, um, I like to kind of picture it as um, kind of scar tissue on the outside. Um, and instead of being able to be more open and, and really address the therapeutic needs, they were instinctually becoming um, more hardened and we were not seeing the outcomes we wanted to see. We were seeing um, increases, increased incidence of um, physical interventions, increased incidence of um, use of controlled observation and those types of things. So. We really saw this when the youth in custody practice model um, first was um, developed. We really saw this as, as a really nice fit and perfect timing for us. So we could use this. We saw this as a, um, it was really a developmental framework and it, it gave us the opportunity to um, pilot this with our first cohort of, of programs, but it, it gave us the ability to move the system forward um, with, with an evidence-based, research-based um, framework, and it wasn't Laura and Garrett sitting in Tallahassee telling our um, privatized group of programs, you have to do this um, because we think it's a good idea. Um, so it, it really it was very helpful in, in that respect. And so the first part of it um, was the assessment process. So from, so from an agency statewide level and also a program provider level, we, we, we did um, a series of assessments and we identified our, our pilots um, we identified, we wanted to get a, a, a nice cross-section. So we have in Florida, all of our programs are privatized. We have a fairly robust um, a provider network. And so we wanted to pick um, a nice cross-section. So we picked one program that was in a really high acuity mental health program for girls um, that was non-secure a fairly moderate mental health acuity um, program for boys that was high risk, and then a non-secure moderate mental health acuity for boys. Um, and we, as uh, Michael said earlier, part of this was the um, six in-person meetings and the facility tours. And so we had the three um, in-person meetings and then three additional meetings that were not directly related to um, a particular um, program or site visit. And the thing that was really neat about this is that, as I mentioned earlier, we, we're, we are a completely privatized system. It is a um, highly competitive, um, contractually competitive process that we utilize. So this is not typically a group of um, programs and providers that um, like to share information with each other. And usually trying us trying to um, encourage them to do that, we, we end up hearing a lot of crickets. So the way that this system or this process was set up, um, really allowed the, the programs and the providers to um, talk about their, um, their, their challenges, but from a really strength-based place and 
it was they, they were able to and encouraged and I think really felt empowered to share their quick wins and there was a whole lot of information sharing at these in-person meetings that we have not seen in um, any other type of process. And in those meetings, we also included um, not just the program staff um, and the staff from the, um, the, the specific programs, but also from their corporate level, from their regional support level, all the way up to the CEOs, so that they, everybody at the program that was participating in this project really could see that it was, um, there was buy-in from, from the top there. And as part of our assessment, both on an agency statewide perspective and then um, from a program program-based perspective, we picked as a state three different areas. And those are the environment, increasing the youth voice, and increasing staff support. And with the environment, um, we've got, at this juncture, we've got 56 programs throughout the state, and many of them, in fact, I can't think of one of them that we actually designed um, I'm very, very jealous of the program in California. Um, I can't think of one of them that we actually designed from the ground up um, that was that had kids in mind. These um, may have been designed for kids, but it was a very correctional model. And so there was a lot of um, softening and a lot of creativity that we needed to use. And um, on the slide here are just some some of the things that um, some of the programs were able to do, um, trying to soften the environment, M making, um, and part of the environment is not just, you know, what's on the wall, but the culture in the program itself, and utilizing as many kind of natural supports from the community and bringing those supports in um, for our non-secure kids um, and for our um, high-risk kids high risk. Um, being able to get out in the community and have the kids practice as much as possible. That was actually, um, and I'll talk a little more about that, but that was actually one of the changes that we made as a state um, is changing some of the rules about when kids can um, get into the community that are in our secure facilities. So. Um, from a from a statewide focus, some of the things that we identified in our assessment is um, a need to really focus on family engagement and looking at um, what kind of changes we needed to make to the rule. Um, are some of the rules that them from our statutes were the definitions of the definition of family was was very traditional and it was it was very limiting and so we needed to look at how do we need to expand that in order to um, be able to have kids connect to the families that they're actually connecting to in real life before they come into our programs and we also looked at our transitional services and what we needed to do from a statewide agency contractual perspective and making sure that our transitional services start as close to the beginning of a child's stay in residential as possible. And, and one of the things that we saw is that um, in in our contracts and in our rule, the um, when a, a transitional service would become active was anchored to the end of the stay rather than to the beginning. So little changes like that. And the assessments really allowed us to um, kind of dive into some things that maybe we didn't spend as much time um, thinking about in just your regular day-to-day -day life. Um, and then in an, another thing that we added, again, from a statewide perspective, and we did this for every single program in Florida, not just the three um, in, in the pilot site. We started it there, and then we expanded it. 
and that was um, putting transitional services managers. We already have case managers and therapists and licensed folks, but these were people that were specifically focused on um, kind of bridging that gap between the community and um, and the program on getting kids connected um, to increase the success in transition as much as possible. And then also putting in um, certified recreational therapists in every single program, some of them have two, um, that allow youth to experience and be exposed to some interventions and activities um, that they may not have had a chance previously. And it, and it gave them a chance to have some real successes. And on this page, um, the drawings and the paintings um, in this particular program, these were actually painted um, by youth. We had a program um, that was part of our pilot, and we had dropped the population to the extent that we had a whole wing that was not being used. So they changed it into um, an, an art gallery, and they've got an art therapist or a recreational therapist there whose focus is art, they bring in um, artists from the community and work with the kids. And and you want to talk about a way to amplify youth voice. I mean, it is, it's really, really powerful. From a program perspective, some of the things that they changed um, again, along the lines of transition and amplifying youth voice and amplifying um, providing support for staff are modifying the days and times um, for visitation, um, for really focusing on the behavioral motivational system and making sure that that kids have a real real time say in the intervention so and, and the enhancements to make sure that they are relevant to that particular cohort of kids and some of the programs um, implemented um, intramural sports um, and clubs for youth and again it's based on the interest of the kids that are in the program at any particular time so they're refreshing their um, their ask for kids and their surveys for kids to make sure that it really truly is relevant and uh, another example is creating a library um, at one of our programs the the program that has the um, art therapy wing or the the, the art wing also has um, Part of that wing is the library, and a, a child actually is part of um, part of that process. They are the librarian. They're responsible for checking books out to other kids, and it's just a way to give kids an, an additional um, positive experience that they probably haven't had previously. Um, another example is um, across all three pilot sites was increasing um, family engagement. With Florida, we've got 56 programs across the state, and it's Florida's a really big state. And in some areas or some, um, some of the populations that we've got in our programs, we only have one or two programs in the whole state. So if, if a child needs intensive mental health treatment and they happen to be a secure um, young lady, then the, we've got one program and she may live in Pensacola, but the program is in um, South Florida. So this family engagement is really tough. So we, um, the programs made, it, made several changes. One was um, changing the days that they do family day, increasing the days, um, utilizing technology on increasing video conferencing, providing van loops, actually getting people from point A to point B and providing that transportation, um, and then increasing that cohesive transition back to the community. So where we are right now is the, um, the, the first cohort of of programs are pilots. One of the factors in choosing one of those three pilot sites is that they were, each of them were from 
our larger providers, our larger so they all had um, they all had more than one um, program. Um, several of them had several programs. So we brought everyone, all of our providers, back together and asked them to pick one or two additional sites. And then we engaged um, the Youth in Custody Practice Model Consultants, Michael being our, our chief <laughs> consultant, to walk us through that process again with this um, expanded group. And um, we had, Michael, did we have five or six um, webinars to cover each of the practice models? Folks developed, um, yeah, and folks developed um, action plans. And then we had a, um, a final in-person meeting where um, programs and their staff you want to talk about staff engagement and empowering staff that they're mostly their teams um, talked about their quick wins and 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 shared with the with each of the other programs what their um, what their successes were and so where we are now is how do we take this practice model and really ingrain it and make it part of the DNA of how we expect services to be provided in Florida. And because we are completely privatized and it is a competitive process and we utilize an intent, intent to negotiate process or an ITN process, we're in the process of including the all of the tenants of the practice model and the expectations of the practice model in our ITN so that when providers make submit proposals, we want to hear from them in their negotiations very specifically. How are you going to increase youth voice? How are you going to support staff? How are you going to ensure that transition happens at an earlier level? How are you going to create the kind of cultures that we know are more conducive to um, positive outcomes for kids? Positive outcomes for kids. And this is Garrett, and we're we're also in the process of working with our Office of Research and Data Integrity, as well as um, Ms. Willard and 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 Michael and all those folks to kind of really get back some information that is, you know, to really get a good handle on what the model is uh, is looking like from a data perspective. And it's been very encouraging that our providers have jumped in feet first to do that. It's also been very encouraging that we're also seeing this stuff already showing up in presentations without even putting it completely in all of the documents yet, which is just a sign that they are actually buying into it without even understanding that they are buying into it. It's becoming part of their DNA as part of ours. And I think it goes back to those collaborative meetings we had with them where everyone was at the same table. Mm -hmm. So um, that's pretty much where we are, how we got here, and where we look at going in the future. Um. Thank you so much, uh, Laura and Garrett, for that um, presentation. I hope, um, you know, to the extent that folks are listening and have questions, feel free to, to type them in um, for Laura, for Garrett. But, you know, Florida has been a wonderful example of an engaged leadership team that has um, sought to get the perspectives of staff from every level and different perspectives in order to inform the efforts moving forward. And a great example of a state, you know, for those of you who are on the line who operate um, state uh, level agencies, or for those of you who, who operate um, or work with private providers um, and private facilities, Florida is a great example of how this work can be done um, in using the practice model as the, the guide for that. So Laura and Garrett, thank you so much um, for your, your words, and we'll make sure if folks have questions to keep you on the webinar. We have about a half hour left, and I do want to turn it over to Charles Bowright, the supervising probation officer from the San Diego County Probation Department. Uh, Charles um, is the uh, primary coordinator for the Youth in Custody Practice Model in San Diego and has been uh, a delight to work with, um, with, his, with his leadership and vision in guiding the initiative. Um, I will say that San Diego is in a different spot than Florida. Florida was in our first cohort, as you heard. San Diego is in the second cohort, 
and um, has completed five out of the six site visits to date. And so we're still actively working um, with San Diego on the delivery of the training in TA, as you'll hear about from Charles. So Charles, um, I'll turn it over to you to, to share a little bit about how San Diego has experienced the practice model. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Laura. Uh, and uh, welcome to all the panelists that are here today. I'm very excited for for you as you uh, consider undertaking this project. It's been a great experience uh, working with uh, the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform at Georgetown University. What I'd like to do is start out by highlighting some reasons why San Diego first applied for this uh, technical assistance. There are four primary reasons that I'll talk about. The first one is that prior to our application, our jurisdiction hired a new chief probation officer. And our new chief probation officer, Chief Gonzalez, was and is committed to partnerships with other county agencies and community organizations. So the fact that the model emphasizes collaboration, uh, it was a proper match philosophically. And beyond that, uh, the commitment to positive youth development and the need for continuous system improvements. I think we can all say that industry-wide, there's a thirst for best practices and evidence-informed practices. And San Diego shares in that desire. And, you know, through previous work with Georgetown University, our agencies developed a trust for, for the work that Center uh, for Juvenile Justice Reform at Georgetown University puts forth and uh, their approach to system improvements. In the past several decades, San Diego County has worked to implement best practices, but it's been on a piecemeal effort. But now with, with, the, uh, with the model being so comprehensive, we're able to look at this in a more comprehensive ma uh, manner. manner. And the timing was excellent too. As Laura mentioned, our jurisdiction is creating a new juvenile justice cam uh, campus. And we wanted to use the data from the model to inform our construction decisions. And so far it's worked out very well. And building off of the timing uh, mentioned uh, with our uh, new juvenile justice campus, our department, when we hired our new chief, one of the first things that our chief did was that he created the professional standards and business intelligent units. And the professional business, or I'm sorry, the professional standards division creates and updates policy. Well, we want our policy and procedures to be informed by the data that the model puts forth. And also our business intelligence unit comes from the research policy and science division, which is committed to using data to improve outcomes. So in summary, our new leadership uh, was a, it was a great match from the beginning uh, from a leadership perspective and also a strategic perspective. perspective. When we completed our application, we enrolled three demonstrated sites. Uh, but we actually had four sites as an agency. We had we operated Camp Barrett, which was a male post-dispositional uh, post camp. We also operated the girls' rehabilitation facility, which is a female post-dispositional camp. We had the Kearney Mesa Juvenile Detention Facility, which is a intake facility for all youth coming into residential care, and also the East Mesa Juvenile Detention Facility, which is a mixture of predispositional and post-dispositional youth. Uh, since uh, since our application, we've combined the Camp Barrett and GRF facilities, so all of our uh, facilities are uh, demonstrated sites right now. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the process. Uh, I'm going to summarize this process uh, by six primary points, but there's a lot of overlap between these um, uh, between these points. Now, once, um, uh, well, the, the technical assistance will begin with a, a background review. Actually, that begins a little bit before the technical assistance period. But what that will involve is that uh, your site manager will collect and send department materials to the consultants. Those are going to be policies. They're going to be procedures. Um, 
uh, inspection reports, so on and so forth. And then begins the information distribution phase. And your jurisdiction will receive the model and the site manager will begin informing partners on the contents of the model and begin to build communities to, uh, uh, for implementation of the practice enhancements. Then begins the orientation phase where uh, uh, conference, call, conference calls will be uh, developed. Um, uh, again, as Michael said earlier, there, uh, the technical assistance period involves six site visits. And during those site visits, um, there's um, going to be practice enhancements that are going to be discussed. The internal review phase begins after those site visits where the site manager will discuss, discuss the practice enhancements with the community members and identify short, medium, and long-term strategies to close the identified gaps. And again, there's a lot of overlap between the internal review phase and the implementation phase, but the implementation phase involves practicing the identified practice enhancements. And then the data collection the uh, phase, which involves uh, the tracking of the practice enhancements to, uh, to, to measure their effectiveness. Now, what does this all mean to San Diego? Looking, you know, so I'd like to take us from a macro view to a more micro view. In San Diego, we've been involved in the practice uh, model for about 13 to 14 months. So far, we've see, received, received 14 domains that are essential for implementation of the model. Uh, those 14 domains involve over 70 practice enhancements that we've identified for implementation in San Diego. What we've done is that the implementation team during the review phase have identified 20 short-term practice enhancements that we're implementing as an agency right now. And those practice enhancements are in the domains of staff support, youth voice, uh, living environment, case planning, crisis management, family engagement, et cetera. And what we've done um, in the areas of family engagement or underneath the domain of family engagement is that we've expanded visits to persons who support the youth in the community rather than limiting visits to biological family members. We've expanded our visiting hours. We've uh, expanded visiting to include video talk, teleconferencing between the youth and um, those that support the youth in the, in the community. And also in the domain of staff support, our managers are more cognizant and are more available uh, for staff who want to discuss the emotional impact of the work. And also managers are recognizing staff on a more regular basis because as Michael alluded to in the beginning of the webinar, staff are essential to the proper implementation of this model. So what are the benefits of the project? How is San Diego benefited from the model in a macro sense? Well, this model provides a well-researched reasoning to reform efforts. And what I mean by that and is that, that our is department has gone from uh, a piecemeal effort to implementing positive youth development to a comprehensive effort. This model gives a why to the reform efforts. And the why is very simply, it's these practice enhancements are statistically proven to improve the environment for the staff and the youth and to improve youth outcomes. And it also provides a framework for cross-discipline collaboration, which was very important to our chief. Uh, the model compels collaboration. Success does not occur in a silo. And uh, the model uh, encourages the jurisdictions to remove the silos and work together as a team because the teamwork approach improves the outcomes, improves outcomes for youth. And also, it provides one manual for, one, one manual for industry standard best practices. Uh, there are literally thousands of academic publications on juvenile justice. And this model provides one manual uh, of the most relevant practice enhancements and the technical assistance needed to implement the enhancements that are, that are in the model. 
and also it, it provides the jurisdictions opportunities for short-term practice enhancements. Now, I don't want that to be misconstrued because this model is entirely designed for long-term sustainability, but the short-term success is emphasized and absolutely achievable uh, you know, through the technical assistance, which supports the external and internal credibility. And with that, I will turn it over to Mike Dempsey. But before I do, I'd like to offer my contact information for uh, anybody that wants to contact me. Uh, my email address is available. Um, if you uh, look at uh, the attendees, the, uh, the panelists, my email address is up there. And I'd like to leave you with my phone number, which is Eric code 858-267-5904. Again, that number is 858-267-5904. And thank you all. Best of luck to all of the jurisdictions. And with that, I will turn it over to Mike Dempsey. All right. Thank you very much, Charles. We uh, we all really appreciate you taking the time out to uh, kind of recap your, your effort and work with the Youth Custody Practice Model. So thank you very much for that. Uh, just to start uh, closing us out and to provide some final information, as you can see, the practice model is a very intensive staff, system, and uh, consulting engaging process. It works to improve conditions of confinement, case planning, services, and outcomes, and also helps to build partnerships that work to improve transitional and reentry planning and continuity of care within the community while improving the facility culture, climate, and atmosphere. As you've heard from Michael and some others, uh, the Youth and Custody Practice Model is an 18-month TTA program that includes six site visits from the assigned consulting team as well as monthly TA calls. It includes a minimum of 143 consulting days from the lead consultants, data consultants, and 15 subject matter expert consulting days. It also includes a data and evaluation component that begins upon completion of the 18-month program in order to measure your outcomes from your participation in the program. Finally, you will have access to other youth and custody practice model sites and peer-to-peer -peer learning in order to take advantage of their experiences, knowledge, lessons learned, and any resources that they may have developed of course, from their participation. The total cost of the program is $205,000. This is an all-inclusive uh, fee and this covers all costs, including travel and expenses for the site visits, as well as all costs and expenses for the subject matter expert days. And, it, and again, this also includes uh, the additional two-year data and evaluation component that will be conducted by Dr. Willard. Finally, uh, let's see, to just kind of cover the application process itself, uh, you can download uh, the application, if you haven't already, at either CJCA or CJJR's websites that are shown on the screen. Uh, you, you need to submit the applications, including the cover sheet, to Darlene Conroy, who is here in the CJCA office. You can email her at darlene.conroy at cjca.net. Some key dates that uh, we need to pay attention to in working with your application. The application deadline is January 11th, 2019, 11.59 p.m. That would be in the application, uh, in your applicant time zone. The finalists will be notified uh, by January 16th, 2019. The finalists interviewed, we will conduct interviews with the finalists January 22nd through the 25th in order to start the preparation work. Selected sites notified January 30th. The orientation calls on February 11th through the 15th. And then TTA commences uh, beginning on April 1, 2019. Just to cover quickly some of the selection criteria, some of which has already been covered by Michael as he went through his presentation, we'll be selecting up to four sites. Uh, to participate. Uh, we're going to spend a great deal of time reviewing the applications and evaluating uh, site readiness uh, for the project. Uh, we'll be looking at the history of juvenile justice reforms within your jurisdictions. 
high level of commitment to quality systems and practice improvements at the agency and facility levels, including through the use of policy development, training, quality assurance, and performance measurement. We'll be looking at your capacity to collect data over a sustained period of time through an existing information system in order to collaborate with the youth and custody practice model data collection and evaluation process. We'll also be looking at the willingness to focus youth and custody practice model implementation in up to three facilities with the goal of expanding implementation to other facilities in your jurisdiction if that's appropriate. Finally, clarity and completeness of the response applications will also be uh, reviewed. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Michael to go through any pending questions that we might have. Great, thank you, Mike. Uh, I am not seeing any any questions that have been submitted via the chat box. I'll give folks an additional minute here uh, to submit any questions and. Um, Jonah and Darlene, please check me on that, but I'm not seeing any questions so far. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Okay. Um, we'll just give folks a few more seconds here uh, to type in any questions. Okay. So it, I think we, we must have done a very thorough job in covering the details of the initiative. Of course, if you have any questions, you should feel free to, to reach out to us. Uh, Mike, I'm gonna turn it back over to you for some closing remarks, including um, sharing some of the contact information for uh, Darlene in case uh, folks do have some questions. So I wanna, on behalf of um, CJJR, I wanna thank everybody for your time today and um, a special, special thank you to Laura, Garrett, and Charles for taking the time to share your experiences and for being willing to talk with folks going forward as well. It's much, much appreciated. With that, I'll turn it back over to Mike Dempsey. I think there's one question that just popped up. Okay. Do you have it or do you need me to read it? I do, I do see it. Okay, great. So uh, the one question, uh, how big are the facilities that have implemented uh, this. So we have, um, I, I will provide a, a, an answer and then I'd love for um, Laura and Charles to weigh in as well. Um, but across the board, um, we have seen uh, facilities that have uh, bed capacity from anywhere to, to 20 to 30 uh, on up. And then uh, facilities that um, have had 100 plus um, uh, young people housed within it. So it really does vary. We've seen it um, in small facilities, we've seen it in larger facilities, um, and again, both detention and post-dispo. But um, Laura and Garrett, I'll start with you. Can you share a little bit about um, the range of uh, facility size that you see in Florida? Cohort, um, we had um, programs that were 50, 60, and 78 beds, so pretty close. And then in the um, expanded um, expansion um, sites, we've got programs that are as small as 24 beds, and we've got one program that is as big as 90. And these Great. are both non-secure and secure programs. Thank you, Laura. And Charles, can you share a little bit about the um, facility size in San Diego? And Charles, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I was just talking to myself there. All right, uh, we have about 300 uh, to 320 youth in our facilities, and that is between uh, three facilities, the Kearney Mesa Juvenile Detention Facility, which was the intake uh, area uh, of our county, the East Mesa Juvenile Detention Facility, which is a mixture of post-dispositional and predispositional youth, as well as the urban camp. Uh, so out of those 300 to 320 youth that we have uh, in our three facilities, we have approximately 120 to 130 post-dispositional youth. 
uh, again, and the post is positional youth are, are at, uh, primarily in the urban camp as well as our East Mesa uh, detention facility. Great, thank you, Charles. Um, we do have another uh, question coming in um, regarding the uh, whether the PowerPoint uh, slides will be available, and um, we will be uh, sure to uh, make them available. I think uh, probably what makes the most sense um, is to post them on our websites as well, so that folks can download and, and um, get them there. Uh, so we will we will make sure to uh, make those available on our respective sites. Um, just give us some time to to upload those uh, accordingly. Okay, um, those are the questions that I'm seeing. Are there any other any other last questions from the webinar attendees? Okay, very well. Um, I'll turn it back over to Mike Dempsey at this point. Thank you, Michael. Okay, just to close us out here real quick, um, I hope the informational call and the experiences shared um, from our previous and current participants in the youth custody practice model have been helpful. And, and I want to sincerely thank everyone on the call today for your interest and your commitment to improving your systems and most importantly, improving the outcomes for the youth entrusted to your care. I want to encourage each of you to submit an application for cohort three. If you have any additional questions, you may contact Darlene uh, at the contact information on the current slide. Uh, again, that's uh, darlene.conroy at cjca.net. Uh, Darlene will be happy to respond to any questions uh, that you may have. If she doesn't know the answer, she'll certainly forward your question out to uh, either uh, other staff at CJCA or CJJAR to get you an appropriate response. So feel free to contact any of us if you if you need to reach out. Uh, we're certainly here to assist. So thank you all again very much, and that will conclude the webinar for today.